the Gates Foundation, um, the TBE program is essentially an integrated initiative um, which focuses on um, a number of components that are interconnected. Um, the aspects of the program uh, essentially are built on a, an attempt to understand and utilize data in transmission science and pathogenesis, which is essentially basic science today, as compared to some of the diseases that Leroy was talking about. Immunology and vaccines, which are potentially at the tipping point where we might know what to do, but not really. We don't have biomarkers of protection or biomarkers of response. Drugs and drug development, which is actually making some progress today and new diagnostics which will uh, essentially move us from 150 years ago or 100 years ago, which are the diagnostics we use today, into the future. Um, and all of this focuses on a, a delivery program that would facilitate changing the way TB is managed um, so that we could improve on the epidemic. Our goal is to accelerate the decline in tuberculosis incidence worldwide. Um, a little bit aspirational, but clearly um, an essential approach to TB. And we are light years away from what's happening in other global health diseases, such as malaria, where we've started talking about elimination, etc. Um, when you look at the TB epidemic and you ask yourself, um, where are we today, and how is the TB epidemic declining um, uh, with all the available tools and systems that are in place? Um, the, the epidemic is actually going down, but it's going down way too slowly, and depending a little bit on whose modeling you, you use, whether it's the World Health Organization or IHME, we're looking at about a 0.7 to 1% reduction per year. In an epidemic which essentially has about 10 and a half cases, new cases per year, and about one and a half million deaths per year. So this is not an epidemic that's going to go away that quickly. There are a number of aspirational targets that have been de defined and declared by some of the communities involved with TB control, and you can see they are way, way more aspirational than the reality today. And the question we started off by asking is, why is this decline so slow? Uh, what is it that's happening today in the 21st century with the TB epidemic that is not actually going to lead to achieving these targets in the decline of the disease? And essentially what we did was we selected 11 countries and actually added on another three to them later, 11 countries um, where, which constitute about 7 million TB cases per year and uh, essentially have a majority of drug-resistant patients, HIV-infected TB individuals and drug-resistant TB that's representative of the complete epidemic. And we asked um, what is happening in those countries. What happens when a patient gets sick and thinks they have TB um, in terms of their care? And the only thing that we, I'd need to just uh, describe is we defined level zero, one, two, and three as the different levels of the healthcare system where level zero is a community health worker in the village. Level one is primary health care system. Level two is district hospital or community healthcare system, and level three is a tertiary hospital uh, where, or medical college, usually in urban centers. And we asked, if you have TB and you live in 11 of these countries, what do you do? Where do you go? What services are available? It's, what services do you get? Are you ever diagnosed or treated for TB? And we st I'm going to give you an example of Ethiopia first. Uh, in Ethiopia, um, of the patients that have tuberculosis, about 77% will go to a public health care system, and about 22% will go to a private 
clinic or private service of one form or another. Of those that seek care at these different sites, 33% will go to level zero, 35 to level one, and 9% to level two. So this is the public sector patients and the level of care that they would go to to seek care if they have TB. A much smaller percentage, the 22% will go to the three different levels of the private healthcare system, the majority in level one. Okay, now, where is there capacity to diagnose TB? Just microscopy, electricity, whatever it's gonna take to diagnose TB. Level zero, there's no capacity to diagnose TB. So these patients, will not get diagnosed. Level one, about 50% will be diagnosed because there is a capacity to diagnose TB in those clinics. Level two, the majority will be diagnosed, close to 80%. And if you look at the private sector, you get a similar distribution. So the majority of patients are going to, are seeking care where there is no possibility for TB diagnosis. Of those, you'll see that only 26.5%, 0.3% that go to level one locations in the public sector will actually be diagnosed as having TB and reported to have TB. In the private sector, about 10% in the level one uh, clinics will be diagnosed. Now, patients will continue Look, seeking care if they don't get better, if they feel worse, if their pa families push it. And some additional patients will end up going to other levels of care until they get diagnosed. The question really is, what happens then? So, among those that are actually diagnosed, cases notified, and how many are actually initiated on treatment? Well, as you can see here, the majority of patients, even though they're already diagnosed with TB, do not actually initiate treatment for tuberculosis. Um, about 35, 40% of patients who were diagnosed in the public sector will be treated for TB, and pretty much none in the private sector. Ultimately, treatment location is going to be uh, distributed such that of those that are actually initiated on treatment, the majority will be treated at level one in the, pu in the public sector, and a small percentage will be treated at different levels in the private sector. And if we now look at the entire cascade of treatment in Ethiopia, what we basically can show is that the only patients that were diagnosed, connected to treatment, treatment and completed treatment are about 45% in the uh, public sector level one, about 8% in the, private, in the public se private sector. So there's about a total of 40% of TB patients who came through the system repeatedly seeking care and trying to be diagnosed and treated that will actually complete treatment and be defined as cured. And remember, completing treatment does not actually constitute a cure necessarily. So the system's not working. Um, if you then compare this to other countries, and I'm giving the example of Indonesia because in a lot of ways it's different from Ethiopia. In Indonesia, of the TB patients, about 54% will go to the informal private care. 13% um, will go to formal private care, and informal is mostly pharmacists, over-the-counter sales of drugs, and about 33% will go to public care. Of those, the majority, again, will be diagnosed in L1. Those that go to L0 will not be diagnosed very efficiently, as you can see, no capacity to diagnose TB. 
about 73, 75% of the patients that go to L1, L2, or 3 in the public sector will be diagnosed and will ultimately be notified 18% of the total. Pretty much everybody who goes to the uh, private sector will neither be diagnosed nor treated for TB. With time, as they rotate through the system, some of them will actually end up going to the public sector. And at the end of the day, you can see a much smaller percent, but about 32% will be diagnosed and will initiate treatment, and about 25, 30% will actually get diagnosed and treated and complete treatment. Everybody who goes for the private sector will be lost. And then if we look at the 13 countries that we've evaluated, you'll see that in general, this picture is very similar. The important message is that regardless of whether the dominant healthcare system place for TB is the public or the private, patients are lost along the pathway to care. Um, if you look at the average uh, globally or within these 77 million people, 72% of the epidemic, 35% will go to the informal private and 39 to the formal private, only about 26 to public care. The public care patients do relatively well in terms of being diagnosed and treated. An enormous loss of patients in the private sector. And at the end of the day, uh, about 40% of patients never get diagnosed, never get treated, and consequently impacting on the TB epidemic and reducing the incidence globally is compromised by the fact that the services simply do not provide appropriate uh, diagnosis and treatment for TB. So if you look at, this, uh, at the outcome of this results, you can see how in each one of the top high burden countries, the number of to predicted total patients and then the number of patients that are lost um, the incident cases versus the new notified cases, um, there's always a gap. And this gap is what's contributing to the failure to reduce the epidemic. So not only do patients have to undergo six months of treatment with toxic drugs, but they actually never even get onto the drugs to be cured. And tuberculosis is an infectious disease that should be able to be cured. Now, one of the uh, aspects of this analysis was trying to understand why do patients uh, fail? Uh, why, for instance, do patients not come to the clinic or don't get diagnosed? And you can see there are a number of reasons, and they vary from country to country that was evaluated. Let me get out of the way. Um, in some cases, the facilities are too far away. In some cases, the costs associated with care seeking are unaffordable for the patients and the system is not paying for that. In some cases, the patients uh, perceive that they're not sick enough to go and seek care and consequently do not actually get diagnosed or treated. Um, this is an example of the relationship between in rural populations and the distance to the clinic um, you know, what is the efficacy of patient care when you look at the impact of how many of the people in the population are rural and therefore will have a longer time, a longer distance to get to the clinic or it will cost more, they'll have to pay for transport, they'll have to lose work, etc. And then this is an analysis that looks at the costs, sorry. This is an analysis that looks at the costs associated with seeking care and you can see that in Three countries here, the, uh, the, uh, the Congo, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, essentially the out-of-pocket expenditure for patients is extremely high, and they just can't afford to seek care and con complete treatment for tuberculosis. Consequently, while the epidemic in, um, for example, New York, has changed significantly over the last uh, just over 100 years. Um, about over 100 years, in, 20, in 1910, we had a generalized epidemic with high incidence in all age groups. Today, we have an enormous reduction in the incidence, and essentially, it's all 
latent TB that's reactivating in the elderly rather than infection of the younger population. Um, if you look at a place like Cape Town, where there's actually been monitoring of the epidemic and healthcare surveillance since 1930, the epidemic hasn't changed. It's a generalized epidemic. Young kids are being infected by adults. Adults are being infected by each other. And the elderly are also getting TB um, at, the, at the very high uh, frequency. Uh, this generalized epidemic that characterizes a city like Cape Town, where there was healthcare monitoring and evaluation for all these years, is what we see in many of the high burden countries uh, today. And that's what, again, is contributing to the enormous numbers of TB cases and TB deaths. Okay, so in that, if, you, if you take that context and then you ask, well, how are we going to fix it? Everybody in this room will say, well, we need better tools. I mean, once we fix the actual system and we assume the TB control programs are improved, even if they use the best drugs available today and the best diagnostics that are available today, those are not going to be good enough to really reduce the epidemic the way we want to. And if we want to develop new tools, better diagnostics, better drugs, etc., cetera, um, we're going to have to understand what we don't know so that we can develop those tools. And we carried out an analysis uh, to address this question at the foundation. And the question really is, why are there diagnostics that are over 100 years old, drugs that go back to the 50s? What, what is it about TB? that has really failed to generate the tools that are needed. Modern tools like what we've just heard about for the 21st century for medicine in the United States. And I think one of the most important characteristics of the understanding of tuberculosis and the research around TB and developing the tools for TB was the fact that the only part of the life cycle of tuberculosis that we've focused on is diagnosing and treating cases. And we haven't even understood, leave alone intervened, in transmission, in progression from infection to active disease, in preventing that progression um, from active disease to being infectious. And if we really want to impact on the TB epidemic, we are going to have to intervene all along the life cycle of the disease um, by preventing transmission and infection, preventing establishment of infection, blocking progression from infection to active disease, and treating and curing active TB disease, which is the only point of focus that, was, that the TB control programs have invested in up until now. So what is it that we're going to need to understand so that we can develop the new tools that are going to have the impact? Well, clearly, one of the things we really know uh, very little about is transmission of disease. In an age where we can essentially capture um, any virus from the environment and diagnose it and develop a new diagnostic within months if necessary, TB hasn't actually been, until recently, captured from the environment and even detected and shown to be viable or non-viable organisms. Um, we need to be able to detect and characterize bacilli that are coughed up or exhaled by patients in order to even understand what are the dynamics of transmission. Who's infectious? Who isn't? How long are they infectious before they treated? Maybe even more important for some, in some situations, how long are they infectious after they start treatment? None of that is known at the moment. So this is one area where we just don't know enough in order to develop the tools we need. The second area that we don't, really, uh, need, that we don't know enough about and we're going to need to understand more we're going to need to identify and characterize outlier populations in order to improve our diagnostic skills. Remember, Leroy was talking about the ability to design a clinical trial where you know in advance which patients are going to respond so that you don't need a large number of patients and you get 95% efficacy when you test a new drug. That's the 21st century. 
In TB, we're having difficulties identifying the infectious individuals. We definitely don't know who is likely to progress from infection to disease. Not to mention what are the characteristics of outlier populations that might confer some resistance or ability to withstand progression from infection to disease or even not becoming infected. The other thing we need are drugs that kill the organisms in all compartments and essentially improve, accelerate, and increase the response to treatment. Today, drug-sensitive patients are treated for six months with daily antibiotics, starting with four drugs for two months and two drugs for another four. And the reason we are not, the treatment is not efficient is because essentially the drugs are targeted at treating the organisms that are in cavities that are coughed up. So those organisms that are um, emitted from a cavity um, and spread the disease. But we know nothing about killing the organisms that sit in the body, in the granulomas, in the lung or other parts of the body. And in order to actually cure patients with treatment, we have to be able to kill organisms that are replicating and non-replicating, that are transmitted from the cavities or are sitting inside granulomas and are not being killed in the cavity or in the lung. And finally, um, as I said, the vaccines and immunology, we clearly don't know enough. We do not have a vaccine that's better than BCG, and we're not exactly sure how protective BCG is. There's some new data that suggests that BCG, the standard vaccine that's been given to neonates, can protect um, individuals who are older if given in the, right, the right way. So we need to understand our existing vaccines, but we also need to develop the new tools that will enable us to prioritize new vaccines, develop the assays to define correlates of protection, and correlates of risk, and then see whether we can actually protect against infection, protect against disease, and essentially intervene in, uh, by blocking progression to disease. Okay, um, this is the time to do it. I mean, sitting and listening to Leroy, I'm thinking, wow. If we could use his tools for TB, you know, there's no case to be made. This is obviously the time. The data analysis, the tools, the ability to miniaturize assays, to cut costs, all that is what's going to drive success if we can only get to a point where we know how and what we want to do in order to achieve that success. There's another one aspect that I'd just like to add to this analysis before we move on. Uh, when we think about tuberculosis, many of us think about drug-resistant tuberculosis because that's where the hype is, that's where the inability to cure is, that's where mortality is much more extensive. Um, so we, we've asked ourselves to what extent should the drug-resistant epidemic be the focus of our efforts if we're going to try and reduce the incidence of TB globally. Well, this is the entire TB epidemic, and that's the 0.5% globally at the moment probably have drug-resistant TB, which suggests that if this is the majority of the epidemic, our focus should be on the entire epidemic and not just on drug-resistant TB. Um, among those who have drug-resistant TB, about we have three categories. Um, we have uh, rifampicin-resistant patients. We have multi-drug-resistant patients who are usually resistant to rifampicin and INH. And then we have extremely drug-resistant patients who are resistant to even more than the two first-line drugs. Um, together, they, as I said, they constitute a minority of the epidemic, but they actually do constitute a majority of some of the headache we have dealing with the epidemic. The World Health Organization estimates that there are about close to half a million incident MDR cases, plus monoresistance is about another 120, 16. Uh, IHME numbers are not out yet, as far as I can tell. Most of these are new drug-resistant cases, cases, and they occur among TB cases as primary, primary drug-resistant. If in the past, drug resistance was being selected for inpatients who failed to comply with treatment, 
um, either for f metabolic reasons or because they were not being, they're not taking the drugs. Today, the drug-resistant epidemic is spreading. It's primary resistance. Drug-resistant patients are infecting new patients. And it's not just failure of treatment. Um, this shifting in the epidemiology, essentially, uh, I'm not going to go into details. I don't want to go over time too much. It shift is uh, creating a situation where of the three epidemics, we're looking at failure to diagnose, failure to treat, and failure to cure, which is extremely high in the drug-resistant patients, although they are a small minority. And maybe the most important thing is that if we don't do something about the drug-resistant epidemic, but we do impact on drug-sensitive patients, the drug-resistant epidemic will, be, will remain and become the dominant feature with time if we're not treating and curing uh, those patients too. Consequently, um, the other consideration that's really important is that the costs of drug-resistant uh, treating, diagnosing, treating, and maintaining some kind of care around drug-resistant patients are way, way higher than drug-sensitive, and they essentially constitute the majority of the budget of most countries with, with high-burden TB. So as we look at what tools we're going to need, what approaches we're going to need, and how are we going to deal with the TB epidemic so that we can utilize modern medicine to eliminate it, what we need to consider is what are the tools that are going to be needed, what are the knowledge gaps that we're going to need to address, and how are we going to implement these tools in systems that don't actually function today for the average TB epidemic in high burden uh, developing world countries. Um, and this is just an example of the costs of TB. For instance, in South Africa, and you can see the relative costs of drug sensitive versus drug resistant in a country that has a relatively good TB control program, but is also missing 40% of the patients, 85% of the drug resistant patients, and is not making the progress that is needed. Consequently, our strategy uh, covers the full spectrum of disease, and we focus on understanding, um, understanding aerobiology and infectiousness, uh, preventing infection and disease with trying to develop new vaccines, developing new diagnostic tools that will help us uh, identify the patients more easily, uh, developing new drugs that will enable faster and more efficient treatment, and ultimately understanding what are the failures of the TB control programs that would be a barrier to introducing new tools that will impact on the epidemic appropriately. Thank you for your attention. Could you um, comment on animal reservoirs, such as wildlife and livestock, and what, how they may be contributing to transmission, and how you might be working with researchers in that venue to address this? So in general, animals are infected with M. bovis, uh, mycobacteria, and not M. tuberculosis. So they don't actually contribute to the, in general, to the TB epidemic as such. Um, especially now that milk, which would come from infected cattle, is boiled or pasteurized, and M. bovis infection is not a major uh, problem in most countries today. Um, it's a whole different field um, of research and investment. It has enormous economic implications, but it's not a major contributor to human TB um, as we know it today. Some countries still have bovis in humans, but uh, most countries don't. Uh, you didn't comment on totally drug-resistant TB. How bad is that problem? Sorry? T totally drug-resistant TB. How bad is that problem? Totally drug resistant. Total. Well, you know, once you get to XDRTB, it's about as good as total resistant in terms of your choice of treatments. Um, in the context of drug resistance and actually targeting the entire epidemic, um, our strategy is to develop a new regimen that has four new drugs that have not been used in the past. 
Consequently, there isn't any pre-existing resistance, and therefore you could use a single regimen to treat everybody who has tuberculosis until they develop drug resistance, of course. Um, the totally drug-resistant patients really cannot be treated and they will die, and they, the majority will die. About 20% probably will survive with TB the way patients have always done. Um, but it's not treatable and therefore needs completely new drugs. Uh, the approach up until now has been, let's develop a new drug and add it to a failing regimen. We'll be able to cure patients for a while, drug-resistant patients, but ultimately drug resistance will evolve. They treat it with one good drug, it's not going to last. So we've decided not to go that route, but to actually just shift out the entire uh, regimen and develop new regimens uh, uh, for treatment of all TB patients. So what is the what's the chances of increasing the diagnostics at the level zero? So in order to diagnose TB at level zero, you really need something that's really easy, re really cheap, doesn't need any necessarily electricity or anything. But maybe the most important thing that you need from these studies is you need connectivity to the sites that can treat TB. So if you diagnose a TB patient at level zero, and it doesn't get referred and it doesn't, the information doesn't get retained to level one, you've wasted your time. There's a big debate whether diagnosing TB at level zero is a solution or whether you actually have to diagnose at level one or at level zero that has really good connectivity, you know, information technology connectivity to where treatment will be available. If you could treat at level zero, it would be different. But it's a chronic disease with long-term treatment. You'd probably have to treat where you can monitor and so on. If you have a triage test, you would have to confirm at level one anyway. So it's, it's an open question. You could probably triage at level zero, refer to level one, confirm and treat there. Yeah, um, along those same lines, I wonder if you could comment on some of the other sort of health systems and, and human or, or institutional factors that contribute to, that, that are potentially fixable to improve the input into the system and the m retention within the system or the you, referral upward. You mean be you besides redesigning the entire TB control program in all high burden countries? <laughs> Maybe in that's addition the to that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, I think there is a, we are at a, at, a turn, at a tipping point, essentially, in the TB epidemic. There's more attention paid to TB. A couple of countries have actually, of high burden countries, have actually made TB a priority in their healthcare systems. India has just recently undertaken to eliminate, to accelerate the elimination of TB, reach a target of 2025. Not sure how they'll do it, but at least they're willing to put money and political commitment into it. South Africa has a fairly highly active um, health care system that's looking for ways to fix control of TB. China is just in the process of implementing a new TB control program that's based on some of this research and some of this data and some of the exploration of new tools that we've been piloting in China. Those three countries already contribute to about 40% of the epidemic globally. There's some countries that are outliers that are not catching on yet, like Indonesia and so on. Um, so I think that what's really going to be needed is national commitment to dealing with TB as a serious healthcare measure of your success uh, in, uh, in, in health implementation. Once countries do that and they're willing to both address the epidemic and fund the intervention, you, we can start looking at changes. But without that, in the case of tuberculosis, forget about the for-profit world. Nobody will make any money. Why would they put their resources into it? Every com company that we talk to, even those who are involved in TB drug discovery, don't really see themselves paying for the phase three studies or the long-term use of their drugs or whatever tools they are. So it's going to have to be national commitment. How you achieve that? Probably by getting one or two champions and then shaming the others. I don't know. Can I ask one more, or is there, are we out of time? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, 
One of the most striking figures I thought was the very low percentage globally of incident TB cases that are at all drug resistant. And as you know better than I, there are studies showing ongoing transmission in certain settings of drug resistant TB. And so the, the obvious interpretation of that graph that you showed is that there must be overall just such a high fitness cost to resistance that it can't transmit well, but, but that doesn't seem to square with the local level data. So how do you think about that? Yeah, I think there used to be a belief in the micro, among microbiologists who were working on TB that drug resistance confers a loss of fitness and it'll just die out on its own. It's not going to spread. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think the epidemiologic data that are showing that drug resistant strains can spread extremely efficiently to normal, non immune compromised individuals if they're exposed. It sort of is the evidence that there isn't a fitness, a general fitness cost in, among drug resistant strains. Uh, we, so we're shifting from a very slow evolution of the MDI epidemic, where individuals that fail end up generating their own drug resistant strain. We're shifting from that being the driver of the epidemic to transmission of drug resistant organisms to others. It won't be any fitter than the average TB strain, I don't think, but it looks like it's not going to be any less fit than the average TB strain. Some of them transmit better than others. Some of them stay much more active in the community. Some of it has to do with social mixing. Um, and if you have primary drug resistance, you're not going to be that sick that you don't socialize the way if you have acquired drug resistance and it's been going on forever. So, yeah, that's a change that's going to potentially um, just increase the drug resistant epidemic at the same rate as the rest of the epidemic unless we do something about it, which means diagnose and treat, better diagnostics and universal treatment. Thank you very much.